As the nation's businessmen rushed to fill the growing demand for products, three distinct problems were becoming increasingly apparent. The capitalist system upon which America was thriving was based in large part on the idea of competition. Fair competition between companies was seen as an insurance that prices would be kept low and quality would remain high. In 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed in an effort to prevent the growth of monopolies or trusts, which occur when one company controls every aspect of production and distribution of a specific product. The antitrust laws had been weakened by Supreme Court rulings, and many businesses were able to create monopolies by the turn of the century. With little to no competition, these trusts were able to set their own prices, and consumers were forced to pay whatever was demanded of them. Another end result of industrialization was the concentration of the nation's wealth into fewer and fewer hands. By 1900, it is estimated that 1% of Americans owned a higher share of the wealth than the other 99%. While some of the richest Americans, like Andrew Carnegie, gave away large percentages of their fortunes, many kept their wealth to themselves. As businessmen enjoyed the high life, the men, women, and children who built their fortunes toiled away in factories. The factory workers of the early 1900s often faced long hours, low pay, and unsafe working conditions. Many of these workers had emigrated from other countries, and while working conditions in America were often better than in Europe, they were still horribly lacking in many areas. As few laws existed enforcing fair treatment of laborers, factory owners and managers often treated their employees as lowly parts of machines. Working 10 to 12 hour days for work weeks that often stretch six to seven days, factory laborers were routinely worn out or ill from overwork. Added to the stress of long hours and pay as low as $1.50 a day was the often unsafe factory conditions. Factories were often filthy, underheated, underventilated, and dimly lit. When combined with massive complicated machines, these conditions often allowed for on-the-job injuries and even the occasional death. The accident rate in America's factories, mines, and railroads was higher than for any other industrialized nation. And at the time, there was no such thing as workers' compensation insurance. Many factory machines were run by women and children, some as young as eight years old. These children, who were paid less than adults, were forced to work the same long hours. This was a typical factory workday for children in the textile factories around 1870. Many families depended on the small incomes of their young children to survive in America. These are the words of Sadie Frown, a 16-year-old sweatshop girl. Those machines run like mad all day long. Sometimes my finger gets caught, then the needle goes through it. If it goes through the nail, too, it hurts real bad. But I just tie a rag around it and keep on sewing. Sometimes the finger has to come off. Y'all have accidents like that. As industrialization spread, the problems associated with it became harder and harder to ignore. Some members of the middle and upper classes saw the dreadful way the poor lived and wanted to do something about it. Many Americans did not know how bad the situation in factories and slums were until they read about it in the books and newspaper articles written by a group of writers who would eventually be called the muckrakers. Journalist Ida Tarbell wrote about the unfair business practices of the Standard Oil Trust. Lincoln Steffens exposed political corruption in the nation's big cities. Novelist Frank Norris published The Octopus, a story of California ranchers' struggles with corporate railroads. In 1906, Upton Sinclair published The Jungle, a powerful expose detailing unsafe and unsanitary practices of the meatpacking industry. The work of these writers galvanized the progressivists, most of whom were native-born, college-educated, middle- and upper-class city dwellers. The progressivists sought immediate reforms, hoping to change society for the better, while preserving capitalism and democracy. Not everyone was so swayed by the muckraking, however. It was Theodore Roosevelt who gave the muckrakers their name. He felt that the muckrakers were necessary to society, but also that they often went too far focusing solely on the negative aspects of the issues they wrote about.